we would like talk about all of the boys on the show, which had I really been able to come out of my shell a little more, probably would have, <laughs> I might have been looking at some of the of the female guest stars on our show too, who knows, but, um, <laughs> but I didn't know that yet. Then I was like, no, women were never on my radar. And then I really thought about it. It's like in retrospect, I think they probably really were. And I just, but I just didn't give myself, I didn't allow myself that, but like making myself happy, I started actually questioning, what does that look like? Um, and that was one of those things where I just, I realized that I had fallen in love with this woman and here we are. By and large, people were really accepting. Um, I feel closer to some family members than I've ever, ever felt before because I think that authenticity was such a breath of fresh air and while unexpected was you know they they knew that that was me saying hey you may or may not have a response that's fun or comfortable for me and this may be a, a, an uncomfortable conversation for you but but here we are i have friends that i expected living in the south obviously there it's uh, the landscape is 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 so challenging is such a misunderstatement at especially at this time um and i didn't really know what that would look like and uh one of my dear friends who has been a friend of mine for over 25 years he was kind of the last person that i told about my relationship with kaylee and he uh and he said to me you know the the beauty of you telling me this is i suspect that you thought that my reaction was gonna be to try to talk you out of it but I want you to know that I love you. I love who you are. I am. I want you to be happy in whatever that happiness looks like for you. And regardless of religion, culture, background, any of it, um, my I will walk beside you. And like for me to abandon you in this moment says so much more about who I am or the lack of who I am than it does about who you are. He gave me this, he gave me this soulful love in this moment where I, I, he knew that I wasn't getting it everywhere that I needed it, but it made up for it a little bit. You know, it just, it, it kind of, it kind of gave me a hand to hold that I didn't think I was going to have. It's my and Bialik's breakdown. She's going to break it down for you because you know she knows a thing or two. So now she's going to break down. Hi, I'm Ayan Bialik. And I'm Jonathan Cohen. And welcome to our breakdown. We're already laughing because we have so much fun this episode. Jonathan, you get to meet someone who knows me very, very well today because who is she? Your best friend from childhood. <laughs> At least that's what she was cast as. Jenna Vonoy, who played Six Lemure on Blossom, is with us. This is a big get for us. A huge... 90s presence, at least in my life and in the lives of so many people who watched Blossom, um, Jenna gets really real with us about, I mean, honestly, things that I didn't know about her from the time. You know, I had all these perceptions of what she was like and what she came from and where she was going. And, um, you know, she's she's a grown up. And I don't know, did you learn anything good? If I'm pitching the episode, what's most important is if you're a Blossom fan, you want to know about the days, uh, the behind the scenes of what it was like on the show, uh, how Jenna got the role, we go deep. We do go deep. And also, um, in addition to, um, you know, she did a bunch of stuff before Blossom. She started acting very young. She was in the Goofy movie, for, for those of you who are 90s kids. Um, that's another thing that she did. But she was also in Born on the Fourth of July. Something people may not know about her. That was before Blossom. And she was on uh, The Parkers. That was another long-running series she was on after Blossom, which was on UPN. Um, she She's done a bunch of shows, but she is obviously so well-known for her time on Blossom. In addition, she recently wrote a short film and is co-producing it for a trilogy called The Cassandra Project um, about elevating women's voices. She's going to talk about that. She went to USC film school. Like, we're going to learn all the things 
Jenna also is going to explain what the F was up with hats because true story, it actually started with her. If that doesn't make you listen to this episode, I don't know what will. Another reason you should listen to this episode is Jenna Von Oy and I have never talked in this depth and like processed and unpacked and like deprogrammed from what our life was like growing up on Blossom. And we're going to get into it. Break it down. Jenna Von Oy, welcome to The Breakdown. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's very exciting to have you here uh, for many reasons. Uh, you have um, a huge, you know, a huge portion of our audience that is just going to be losing their minds right now uh, because much of our audience, you know, is of the demographic of people that, you know, are are fascinated with sort of like where people are, especially from the 90s. There's a huge nostalgia. I wonder if you can, before we even get started with, you know, hearing sort of who you were before, you know, the Blossom years and who you are now, can you talk a little bit about this like 90s nostalgia? I, I have mixed feelings about it, but I'm curious what your kind of take <laughs> I, on it is. I guess I have mixed feelings too, in a sense. Um, I mean, it's, it's still very real for us, I think. <laughs> like, like, there's still a part of my brain that's like, oh, yeah, I'm, you know, we're going to work tomorrow and we're going <laughs> to wear hats and um, and I'm going to talk fast. And um, I don't know. It feels like yesterday. So it's a bizarre transition to look in the mirror and be like, oh, we're, we're adults now. And, you know, we've sort of like transitioned into this other level of life. Well, I was recently on David Lasher and Christine Taylor's uh, podcast, and um, you know they're they're getting all these like '90s stars, and you know many people that we hung out with, like worked with, knew about, and it like it took me a minute to remember that like they were on a show together. <laughs> like it, it it's kind of like I a lot of that chronology. You know, I remember what people looked like when we were all teenagers. Um, but like you mentioned that you ran into Steven Dorf and like, you know, I still see Mario Lopez. Like it's so it's so strange, like to put um, to put that kind of chronology together um, and, and we'll kind of get to all that. But I I, I think that um, it would be helpful for you to kind of talk a little bit about where you grew up and what your young kind of acting life was like, because you started acting very young. And I remember when we worked on Blossom, you know, you and Joey were veterans. Like I was literally, that was the first TV show, you know, that I was like, you know, kind of in with any regularity. Like this was all a very new world to me, but you had a lot of experience in the industry. So can you talk a little bit about, you know, where you grew up and what it was like and then how you got into acting so young? Yeah, absolutely. And and to be fair, going back for just a second, running into Stephen Dorff yesterday, when I say I ran into Stephen Dorff, like I didn't even say hello because I was so... <laughs> so sure that he was not going to remember me or maybe even that he was on a show called Blossom once upon a time. So I just refrained from saying anything at all. So apparently the chronology has in fact set in for me somewhere in the recesses of my brain. Um, but yeah, I, I started really young. I, um, when I was about two and a half or so, the story goes, I told my parents that I wanted to be an actress because I saw this Jorash Jeans commercial remember those. Yes. Um, and, uh, and these girls were doing ballet and I took dance classes at the time and there was something that resonated. And I said to my parents, Hey, that's, uh, that's what I want to do. And they said, ballet, you already do ballet. And I said, no, I, I want to be on TV. Um, and I want to say that that was probably the first inkling that I had, uh, that those were people because they were children my own age. And, and I don't know, I, I don't know what I, what concept I had of it prior to that. But in that moment, that was me realizing that there were actual children who had this thing, whether I thought it was a job or something they did for fun, an extracurricular activity after school. I don't know. Um, but I was like, that's, that's what I want to do. Um, and my parents were like, Oh, that's so cute today. An actress tomorrow, a, a fire woman. Um, and that, you know, latter half of that never showed up. It was always an actress from that point on. Um, mm. And at some point, my dad, who, um, you know, I, I come from a really small town, really, my parents are 
my mom's from a small town in Wisconsin. My dad is from a small town in Connecticut. And, you know, they knew nothing about the industry at all. This was not anything that I was groomed to be. Um, but my dad worked at a restaurant with this woman who had just started taking her son to New York uh, on the train for auditions. And mm. she met me and she was like, that one. <laughs> um <laughs> Of course, we later found out she was stealing money from me, but that's that's <laughs> a story for another day. That's, I mean, that's like the, the 80s and 90s all day. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so that's that's kind of how I started. Was she started taking me to auditions? Yeah. So so tell me, like, and and you you have uh, you have more siblings than some people. Not, <laughs> uh, I mean. Not many all people, people come but from some people, right? Not a people, but yeah. some people. Yeah. Um, but you know, you you um, you know, you you came from a family where you know, when you have a lot of kids in a family, everybody's got a distinctive personality. Everybody's got their thing. Um, what, what do you think? Like now that you're a grown up, now that you're a mom, what was it? Like, what was it about you? Well, I'm the oldest of four. So there was no pre me to sort of (laughs) set the stage for what was to come. And I think my parents didn't know what to do with me. I, I, honestly, I, I think they were just baffled. Like I, I didn't stop talking shocker. I know. And I had a lot of creative ideas and I was constantly writing things and creating songs. And they were just like, this is, this is sure. This is normal. This is what kids do. Um, and then they had enough people say, this is a little off the normal track, um, to, to start listening when I was saying, this is, really what I want to do. I'm telling you, I want to be an actress and please help me find a way to do this. And to their credit, they did. I, I, you know, now being the mom of two, I'm like, I don't know what I would say. And granted, there's a lot of experience behind me now. Um, so, uh, you know, with my parents being as green as they were, I'm sure they had no idea what they were in for. Uh, but I don't know. My, you know, we all had our own sort of thing. Like I, as, and I think this is a very common, I'm sure it's still very common, but it was very, my brother and I have talked about this a lot. Um, he was, I was the creative one. He was the smart one. My sister was the athletic one. And then my youngest brother is nearly 11 years younger than me. So with that gap, he was sort of allowed to be a little bit of all of it without any, any sort of, um, classification that had to remain with him. I also think of your youngest brother as the baby because that mm-hmm. often happens in a family, especially like yeah. when I met you, he he was, he was still little. So he was two, then, I think. Right. So like yeah. then that kind of became became the personality. So um and how far were you from from the city? Because also for people who may not know sort of that region of, you know, like surrounding New York areas, you can definitely not be from New York, but be New York adjacent enough that going into the city for auditions is a thing. But what do you remember as a kid? Yeah. And such was the case. We were a, a, probably a two hour trip to New York. Um, and when I say I, I took the train to the city for auditions, I mean, we were there multiple times a week. Um, my parents devoted a lot of time to taking me in. Um, I have very fond memories. My father is really tall, as you may or may not remember. Yes. Uh, unlike yours truly. <laughs> <laughs> and I got all the recessive genes, all of them. Uh, but my dad is really tall. And so I just have very fond memories of like trying to keep up with him on the long blocks in New York, uh, going to auditions and he used to carry me on his shoulders. And, um, mm. yeah, that was, it was, I spent a lot of time in, in the city when I was a kid. And so what, um, you know, what, what kind of jobs were available to you? I mean, you were adorable, um, and adorable children, you know, was, there was a market, you know, for that, um, you know, in television. So, um, this would have been early eighties, right? Early mid eighties. Yeah. I want to, I started when I was six years old. So, and I was born in 77. So go ahead and just throw that out there. Um, uh, (laughs) so Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, it was the early eighties and, um, I started in commercials and voiceover work and all of that. And, and then it sort of moved into 
guesting on shows. And I mean, we're talking everything from like Kate and Allie to Tales of the Tales from the Dark Side and just mm. like, you know, the shows back then. Um, I auditioned for a little bit of everything. I did some films and I um I remember doing a a reading for um a really a movie that ended up being huge later at uh Paul Newman's apartment overlooking <laughs> Central Park. Like just just random, random memories that jump back in when um but I mostly was like at, at the very beginning, my thing was that I wanted to be a triple threat. That was, I, I just knew that that was my lot in life was like, I was going to dance and sing and act. And I was going to be on Broadway. Uh, lo and behold, I was just like, not as excited about being on stage as I thought I was going to be at the beginning. But, um, but I did also audition for a lot of Broadway stuff and, um, seven auditions in front of Stephen Sondheim. And I, and I wow. was quite sure that I was going to be a little red riding hood and into the woods and that I didn't fit in the same spotlight as the guy who played the wolf. And so that one was out. And that was like the only, that was like one of the biggest disappointments of my early childhood was not getting to do that. My and Bialik's Breakdown is supported by BetterHelp. Every week, my job is to balance my job, but also my job as a mom my job wanting to be of service to other people and trying to keep myself in the mix. But if you get caught up in what everybody else needs and you don't take time to think about what you need, you can feel stretched thin and burned out. Therapy can help you have the tools to find more balance in your life. For me, therapy has been a huge component of me learning to balance my needs and those of others with no one getting left behind and me having reasonable expectations about where I can be helpful to others, but also to myself. Why don't you give BetterHelp a try if you're thinking of starting therapy? It's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. It's all online. You just fill out a brief questionnaire and they'll match you with a licensed therapist. Switch at any time for no charge. Find more balance with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash break and get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash break. Mind Bialik's Breakdown is supported by Ritual. They say giving birth is kind of like running a marathon, but what about being pregnant and building a company from scratch to take on the multivitamin aisle? Well, that is the story of Ritual's founder, Kat Schneider, who started Ritual because she honestly couldn't find a prenatal that she really could trust. It has been easy and painless to incorporate Ritual into my daily routine. Ritual's high-quality, traceable key ingredients are in clean, bioavailable forms, so you really can trust what you're putting in your body when it matters most. During pregnancy, they have an all-in-one formulation with choline and clinically studied methylated folate support for your baby's neural tube development, and they have vegan omega-3 DHA to support your baby's brain development. They have citrus or mint essence capsules, and they're designed to be easy on the tummy, so take them when you want, with or without food. That's a huge plus for me. Ritual is non-GMO project verified, soy-free, gluten-free, and vegan, and their delayed release capsules are designed for optimal absorption. Why settle for a multivitamin that you're not 100% sure about? Ritual was built on trust, so it's the real deal. Ritual's offering our listeners 10% off during your first three months. Visit ritual.com slash breakdown to start Ritual or add Essential for Women Prenatal to your subscription today. Yeah, what, what do you remember? Because like, you know, a lot of, I wasn't acting a long time, you know, before Blossom. Um, and this is, you know, I think you and and Joey are, you know, people who understand this uh, best. You know, people refer to me as like a child actor. I'm like, I totally get it. You know, I started professionally acting um, when I was 11. But, you know, the, the, the years before that, to be in the industry is very different than not being in the industry. And so I would always reference you and Joey, you know, because yeah. you had a lot more experience. Like, that's just the truth. Like, it would have been true if you had a year more, but you didn't. You each had, you know, between the two of you, a decade of experience, you know, doing things that I didn't really understand. So I was still very new, you know, to the to the acting world. Um, I got cast in Beaches a year after I started acting. But what I remember was that I was not an emotionally resilient child when it came to rejection. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that because um, you, you know, you always struck me as having a lot more confidence just kind of like in yourself and in your talent. And I wonder, were you always like that? Because I have friends who are just like, if I get it, I get it. If I don't, fuck them all, you know? And like, I was never like that. But I wonder if you remember there being a progression of how you dealt with, because also like to be a child and be told like, 
no, you're not cute enough or someone else is better. Like, that doesn't feel good. (laughs) No, and that has really long-term effects that we probably don't talk about enough. But um, I I think it's interesting, first of all, that that you saw me as confident because I, I felt that I was the least confident person that I knew. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I struggled often with being different, um, and feeling because I was always enrolled in the curriculum at my, at my school growing up. Um, so even in, you know, middle school and high school, when we were working on the show, I always felt not quite where everybody else was in terms of going to prom and having those Mm. normal adolescent experiences that, um, I, I would, I mean, I would obviously, I don't regret a thing. I would choose it all over again. Um, I, I don't mind that I missed out on those things, but I did always feel a little bit confused about how to be a normal kid because of it. Um, there were, because that element of being a normal kid wasn't really part of our normal everyday existence. Um, we had such a unique experience shared experience during our highly formative years. And so Mm -hmm. confidence for me really fell short and to a certain extent still does. There's a lot of, for me, I think it was a lot of the people pleasing aspect, the, um, the being the quintessential girl next door. And in some way, um, you know, that sort of warms its way into your psyche. And there's this, this, part of my, of my brain. That's like, yeah, I'm still a a ripped jeans, flannel shirt wearing (laughs) teenager from the nineties who wants to be everybody's BFF. Like that's, you know, Mm -hmm. there's a, a certain part of that that remains. Um, I think in a way my exuberance may have overshadowed lack of confidence. I am a very outgoing person when I need to be. I'm also highly introspective and love to have alone time. Um, but that, that people pleasing aspect that of my personality, that, that need to sort of live up to expectation and having spent so many years being the girl next door and feeling like that's ever, what everyone wanted from me. And to a certain extent still does, um, probably belied what was really going on in there. Hmm. Um, I likely was as lacking in confidence as you were, just maybe not overtly. Yeah, that makes sense. And I, I think the other thing like that I wanted to ask about is, you know, the role in your family changed from an early age in a way that, you know, obviously my role in my family changed, you know, when when I began getting paid to do something that I just like enjoyed doing. So I'm not, I'm not necessarily like, you know, asking you to speak to like money per se, but um, maybe you can talk a little bit, you know, about, you know, kind of how your role in your family had to change both, you know, before Blossom, because even, you know, even the success you're talking about, that may not be like, we're going to buy a new house. Right. But it definitely is like, oh, this thing that our daughter's good at and natural at, and that people want to, you know, have her do is also a, it, it's like a thing that, that like she gets paid for. Like, it's just, it, it kind of changes your role in the family. And I wonder kind of what that was like, because also your siblings were young, you know, like you were all little, like it was, you know, you were a, a new family in, in for your parents, right? They were just still building their family. And you have this kid who like has not only like making money, but like has this independence and is like having a career and people building her up. And, you know, it's kind of like everyone was our parent. That's how I felt. Like everybody I worked with kind of became a parent in some way. Interesting. I, my experience differed slightly, but I also wonder if that's because I went back and forth so often to Connecticut. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, my parents did this crazy thing where my mom stayed with me in Los Angeles and my littlest brother, Tyler, um, and my dad stayed with my middle brother and sister, Peter and Elisa, so that they could maintain their schooling. Um, the, you know, the schools in Connecticut are really known, um, 
known for being much more aggressive than than the majority of schools in California, at least if it's not a private school. Um, but the public schools are super aggressive and, and great. And so my parents really felt like it was important to keep them engaged there. And um, and they had all their friends and their after school activities and uh, things that they were amazing at. And, and my parents wanted to, and, and I'm glad they did, it was important that they did support them and, and encourage them to continue being who they were and to take them out of that wasn't really a fair thing. Um, and so we really just went back and forth as much as we could. So I always kind of felt like we were going back to get grounded, which Mm. really was helpful. Um, Looking back, that's probably the best decision they could have made as hard as that probably was for them to be a part like that. I I can't imagine making that sort of sacrifice. Hey, Uh, some of the best marriages happen when people aren't in the same place. Now that's also true. (laughs) That is so very true. Um, So yeah, I think, you know, I don't feel, I didn't feel quite as parented by other people. I felt like I was going back to being parented by my mom and dad. I felt like they shielded me from a lot of stuff that looking back, in a sense, I kind of wish they hadn't. Um, I think I was delayed in really having a more worldly understanding of certain things, whether they happened on or off the set, because my parents were so good about sort of keeping me in this bubble. Um, but that I think also turned into some confusion later in adulthood when the world sort of (laughs) threw itself at me and said, here I am. Um, you know, it's a little odd to live in that kind of small arena of, of going to the set and going back home to do homework and going to sleep. And then on hiatus weeks, going back to see your family and Mm -hmm. being a part of that. And I don't know, there was, there was no, there was really no time for much else. You know, I really thought of you, you know, as like you and your mom and Tyler. And then, you know, we, I would get to meet your other siblings and your dad, you know, sometimes like they would come out and. It was um, a circus. Yeah. But um, yeah, maybe, maybe we can kind of shift then a little bit to how you got to, um, you know, your blossom years, because you had, you know, kind of this this batch of years where you were doing other things. And you were, as you said, you know, working, um, would you say you were working like regularly, semi-regularly, like enough that you were still in school, obviously enough? Yeah, I felt I was working fairly regularly, but because it was smaller projects, you know, like you, I often, I looked at Joey as the veteran. I didn't consider myself that way at all. I can completely understand why you saw, right. put Joey and I in the same category in that way, but I, but I didn't see it that way. Uh, right. For me, I'd had all of these sort of abbreviated experiences throughout the years you know, and Joey having been on long running, a long running show and being a regular on it, he, um, he had an understanding of how things worked on set that I did not yet have. So I really Mm -hmm. gained a lot of my experience at the same time that you gained yours. Yeah, for sure. Um, that's interesting. And, you know, kind of before we, cause I want to, you know, kind of hear about how you first, you know, got to audition and things like that. But Um, I think that was one of the things also that felt really different about Joey's family versus our families. Um, You know, his family was already really structured around Mm. him, him as the centerpiece and the star, you know, of what he did. Um, And this is not, you know, in any way to speak disparagingly about anything, but I'm saying like for us, I feel like our families, our moms were kind of figuring it out. Like it was our first time as regulars on a set. Like it was our first time, you know, having a company that like we had to, you know, have interactions with year after year after year. Like it was a very, it's a very different world. And it's true. Joey's family was really structured. You know, I feel like we were still learning, like, what's a business manager? Like, what? Like, how do we do that? Like, who's a lawyer? Like, I felt like we were both very green that way. You know, my parents were not industry people. Like, they were public school teachers. And, you know, so, like, we both kind of, it's true. We're we're learning at the same time. Um, Tell us how, you know, a girl from a small town in Connecticut gets an audition for a TV show that eventually would lead to you relocating across the country when you were not even finished with middle school? 
<laughs> right. Um, yeah, I I auditioned in New York, uh, uh, and on the it's a kind of bizarre story. The day that I auditioned for Blossom. I was taking the train into the city. Um, we got on in Fairfield, which is where we always got on. My grandparents lived in Fairfield, and so that was the, that was our that's where my dad grew up. So that was our train station. And um, and this guy was sitting behind my mom and I, and I remember he said um, he asked me some sort of question about why we were going to New York, probably thinking that we we're going to see a show or I, I don't know what he thought, you know, skating at Rockefeller center, who knows? Um, and he, and he asked me what we were doing. And I said, you know, I've got three auditions today. And that was fairly typical for me to have multiple auditions in one day. And it was for like a, a commercial and, um, a mini series. And I said, and I, and I'm on and, and a show called blossom. And he goes, Oh, that last one, wait, what's it called? And I said, blossom. And he goes, that one, that's the one you're going to get. What? Get yeah, this is so weird. And he goes, get ready. And I didn't, I mean, I was 12. I don't know. I didn't really know what to say about that. And I was like, okay. Um, well, at the next train stop, like, you know, th- there aren't many stops between Fairfield and, um, and Grand Central. And at some point we turned around, well, the guy wasn't there anymore. And he must have gotten off at 125th street or something. I don't, I don't know where he went. I really, this guy like disappeared. And, um, but I looked at my mom and I was like, well, what, what would we do if I, if I got a show like that? And she goes, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. And I was like, no, I think, I think we have to cross the bridge now. I think we need to talk about it because this guy just said, I'm going to get that. (laughs) So such a bizarre circumstance, but it really did kind of get us in that frame of mind of what would we do? Um, what would that look like? Um, how would that change how we work through our schooling and family and all of these things? Um, and so I don't know if you remember this, but when I, so I, I went to the audition and I wore this big wide brimmed purple hat and it had buttons Mm -hmm. down the front somewhere in the recesses of my attic. I am certain I still have this hat. (laughs) Someday I will find this uh, and I will send you a picture when I do, but, um, wide brimmed purple hat. And when I got the call back, apparently Don had, Don Rio had said to my agent and make sure she wears the hat. Oh (laughs) yeah. And so I wore this hat again and then I was flown to LA for the screen test. Simultaneously, I was screen testing for a show on CBS called Lenny. Mm -hmm. And um, also written by Don Rio, Mm -hmm. unbeknownst to NBC and CBS, I was going to network the same day for two different Don Rio shows on two different networks. And um, one character was obviously fast talking and, and really ebullient. And, and the other one was very, um, dry, sarcastic, you know, snarky kind of girl. And, uh, and apparently I can pull off both. <laughs> the screen test for Blossom was first. And I met you mm-hmm. at the studio and, um, and we went to network and they told me right there that I had gotten it. And I still went to the screen test for Lenny. Um, and did I go to, um, now now like my brain is not functioning. Did I go to the screen test for Lenny? Maybe I didn't. Maybe they canceled that screen test because I had already gotten Blossom. And they cast somebody else in it. And when we finished our pilot, at first we didn't get picked up. Mm-hmm. Um, and while they were restructuring Blossom for a mid-season replacement, they called me and asked if I would do Lenny. And so Lenny did get picked up and I did the first half of the season of Lenny. And then Dawn called me in my school room mm-hmm. a day. I'll never forget. I'm just being tutored on the set, doing a little math. And, and I get this call from Dawn and he's like, Hey, so I know that you're already on this show, but, um, do you want to be on another one? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. And I got to, to come back and, and reprise my role of six. 
MindBeyond's Breakdown is supported by Squarespace. Squarespace is the all-in-one platform for building your brand and growing your business online. Stand out with a beautiful website, engage with your audience, and sell anything. Products, content you create, even your time. Squarespace makes it super easy for creators and educators to monetize their content and expertise in a way that fits their brand. There's member areas where you can unlock a new revenue stream for your business and free up time in your schedule by selling access to gated content like classes, online courses, or newsletters. Also, stand out in any inbox with Squarespace email campaigns. You can collect email subscribers and convert them into loyal customers. Start with an email template, customize it, apply your brand ingredients like site colors and logo, and they have built-in analytics to measure the impact of every send. Also, you can support your cause by gathering contributions with PayPal, Apple Pay, Stripe, and Venmo. You can gain powerful insights into who's visiting your site and how they're interacting with your content with an in-depth website analytics tool, like page views you can look at, traffic sources, time on site, most read content, audience geography, and so much more. They also have powerful blogging tools if you want to share photos, videos, and updates. Categorize, share, and schedule your posts to make your content work for you. Display posts from your social profiles on your website. Automatically push website content to your favorite social media channels so that your followers can share it too. Go to squarespace.com slash breakdown for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, use the offer code breakdown to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. You know, for people listening, this is like not a typical thing to have happen. Jenna was, a, I mean, Jenna was a very, very special, you know, a very special talent. And um, it is not typical to be cast in two shows or even to be up for two shows simultaneously. So, um, you know, there was, you know, a certain, a certain zeitgeist, you know, there was a certain thing about Jenna and, you know, her presence that was really special. And in terms of casting, you know, a friend for Blossom, what was unusual about our show was that it was based around me, this female that didn't look like other girls on television. Don wrote a character that was originally supposed to be a boy. It was supposed to be Catcher in the Rye, like, you know, a TV show based around a, a, an exceptionally precocious but also playful, you know, character that was supposed to be a boy. And so we already were, like, doing a weird thing. We had this weird lead character. And again, like, I was just in beaches and everybody was excited, but also shows about girls. There was no network shows about girls at that time at all. Um, So everybody thought Don was crazy. Um, I mean, everybody thought we were crazy. So the question is, when you have a lead character who typically is the strange looking friend. I mean, that's really what I'm usually cast as. I'm the I'm the I'm like the quirky friend. I'm like the weird one. You know, the question is, who is that person's friend on television? And extra quirky friend. An is extra the, quirky friend. Is well, the and for that. no, but I think, but I think it speaks to a lot of the quality that you brought as a comedian to this show because Jenna was a person who could carry a plot on her own, and you know, did. Um, she also was, um, you know, she was a special kind of precocious. You know, she had this, this, I don't mean to talk about you, like you're not here. Um, <laughs> but, it is a little weird. You know, I'll admit, but a little yeah. weird. Sorry. Um, no, but, uh, but I'm saying like when people think about like, oh, Blossom and Six, like it was this beloved, you know, pair, but also we were both non-traditional leading ladies. You know, we, we were both like quirky and we had like a thing about us and, you know, Don ended up, you know, capitalizing on your, you were very bubbly, you know, you were exuberant and bubbly and Also, like you had a very East Coast way about you, like you had a a deadpan ability that, you know, when um, when asked why her name was six, like the answer was my father said that's how many beers it took. And like you don't expect a 12 year old, you know, to deliver things the way Jenna could and did. Um, And what ended up happening, you know, was was we did. We had this sort of friendship that got to grow on television. Um, that I think for a lot of women in particular, and you know, men as well, but I think for a lot of women in particular, this felt more like what friendships actually looked like than a lot of the friendships that we had seen on television. Because Jenna and I, you know, we watched 90210 and like everybody was gorgeous and like everybody was amazing and they and looked 40 like real women. Playing and our and age. 40. <laughs> but that's yeah. Right. But we we were actual teenagers, you know, who actually enjoyed our lives and 
you know, I think we both kind of experienced that struggle of like, we were girls becoming women, like at a very awkward time, you know, of adolescence to, to be on television. Um, but we were really, I mean, I, I hope you agree, like we were gifted with material that was like very interesting and it was funny. And I think especially for girls on television, it was not, um, you know, it was not what a lot of people were used to. You know, we we had a show also that, you know, was always fighting for ratings, always, always yeah. fighting. And it's funny because people are like, but it was Fresh Prince and Ben Blossom. And and it's like, yeah, but we actually premiered after the Cosby show. No one thought anyone would watch a show about a girl. That's what they said. They said girls will watch, will watch girls and girls will watch boys, but boys will only watch boys. And we were up against Monday Night Football. Like, it was, like, impossible. And it, it was always, like... the deck like, was stacked. It did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so I think also, like, a lot of... A lot of what I remember was, you know, both in an attempt to capitalize on, you know, like, Joey's teen idol status. Um, and, and also in an attempt to sort of build up ratings. Like, Jenna and I also grew up on a set where it was very common to have Playboy models and half naked women in dream sequences and all these things. And it's funny because like, I was this, like, I'm sure no one's surprised, like diehard feminist, like I didn't shave and I wore Doc Martens and like, I was dark. Um, but you know, for both me and Jenna, we were also like trying to find our own identity as women in a culture at that time that was still completely comfortable with just like, I mean, I remember when we would have Playboy models on, like word would get out on the lot and men from other sets would just like show up to take pictures with these women. And look, God bless these women. That was, they were used to it. But, but the Jenna, exploitation you, was really right. prevalent. <laughs> and, it, and, and it was so normal. I mean, everyone treated it like it was normal. If that happened today, it would be a I, I mean, sets would be shut down. sag after would be stepping in. There would be, I, I can't even imagine what would be, what would be going down. Yeah. Um, can you, can you talk a little bit? I know I just kind of like said a mouthful, but I wonder if you can talk a little bit about sort of like what you remember, you know, of these kind of formative years in particular, as you sort of, you know, blossomed from a girl into a young woman in front of America and the world actually. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, first of all, you're right. We we had a very, at the risk of overusing this word, but we had a very groundbreaking show. I mean, Don somehow managed to step into this young female teenage skin and, and, and write in this very authentic way that um, that allowed us to pursue subject matters that I think most shows were either uninterested in pursuing at that time or couldn't handle the backlash on, or I don't know, somehow Don was given this like carte blanche to write these things that most shows didn't tackle. And I, I love that we got to be a part of that. And then you pit that against the fact that there were, you know, scantily clad women on a weekly basis showing up in Joey's dream sequences. And, um, I, I don't know. It, it was a very weird dichotomy. <laughs> um, I I don't know if I really... I always thought of those women as so much older than me at that time. Totally. That I don't know that I really sat there and thought, oh my gosh, I don't have that. Um, hell, I probably wasn't even wearing a bra yet. I mean, I I just... I think that kind of awareness showed up more in my personal life. Um, when I went back home, for example, to finish high school in Connecticut. Um, and for example, I remember that I went to a, fr a friend was having a bunch of classmates over and I hadn't been there in months because obviously I'd been in LA on the set and, and one of the boys came up behind me and like went to go snap my bra, which was <laughs> such a common thing. I wasn't wearing one because I was flat. I didn't need a bra. Like what? What? Um, and so that kind of thing gave me probably more awareness than these than these ridiculous women that <laughs> that had their breasts hanging out and were wearing bikinis on you know um, on a, on what for all intents and purposes was thought to be a kids show but you know <laughs> I don't know it's like I'm, kids were different I, yeah times were different they really they, they were so different. Um, yeah, again, I go back to, for me, it was less, I think it was less about 
what uh, less about like the feminism side of it, which I really didn't have an understanding of until far later, and more about this going through these awkward years in front of people and trying to be what they wanted me to be or what I perceived that they wanted me to be. Um, and I sort of became fixated, I think, on uh, on making sure that I was giving people, giving the people what they want. Um, you know, and so for example, I had a horrible time with acne, but I, you know, they, Linda and all of our amazing makeup staff did like this incredible job of putting makeup on me every day, but I got used to that. So this daily makeup became daily makeup in my own personal life. Mm. And, um, God bless COVID for making me realize that maybe wearing makeup every day, (laughs) that's horrible to say, but like, you know, for that, that is something that, that really I was reminded of, I think working from home a lot and, and being at home so much during, during the lockdown was like, oh yeah, I I can let my skin breathe. Like I don't have to do this. This isn't a necessity. It's a work in progress. I'm still learning. Um, uh, but there were days where with all of this horrible acne, I would like go to the grocery store. And this was the concept of, of giving people what they want was very much supported at home for me. And so, um, I recall, for example, I was like going down to Ralph's for milk and I was told, wait a minute, you're going to go like that? Cause I had no mm-hmm. makeup on. Um, and I was encouraged to go back and put makeup on to ensure that mm-hmm. in case somebody recognized me, I would be presentable. And so mm-hmm. there very much was this facade of presentability and what that looked like. And, um, and I, I probably hid behind that for a really, really long time. And it's very, um, it's sort of hard to live in your own shadow. As much as it's hard to live in someone else's shadow, it's very hard to live in your own shadow. Uh, and I've very much lived in in the shadow of this this person that I thought people wanted to see for a very long time. And I think also, um, you know, one of the things that, you know, when I look at, what it's like to be a girl on TV or a teenager, you know, in the public eye now, I don't, it almost feels like it's a completely different, like, century. Like, it feels so different because obviously there was, of course, like, that notion of presentability and, and you know, we each had our particular things. And, um, but, you know, when when people ask, like, oh, like, did people tell you to be on a diet? I was like, no, Jen and I just like had the bodies that we had. Like we didn't even right. think about it. And and also, you know, when I think there weren't really like there were publicity things, but you usually just like did your own like hair and makeup or like I remember Joey and I like once went to the People's Choice Awards or whatever. And it's like then like the people who at work did our hair and makeup, but we didn't have like personal stylists. Like we weren't getting manicures and lash extensions and like all these things that are like, you know, really like, for at, at least in my perspective, like laborious for grown women, much less teenagers. But I feel like in a lot of ways, like culture was so different. And I don't think people remember kind of what, you know, early 90s was like, like, you know, I have pictures of us when we went to the NBA All-Star game and like, we're in like Nikes and t-shirts and like, you know, we were just, we just kind of looked like kids, you know? And um, I, I wonder sort of if you have any sort of reflections on kind of, you know, the, the differences between what it was like for us to grow up, you know, in the public eye versus what it's like for young women now. For obvious reasons with social media and such, I, you know, one bad picture is out there forever. I think it was Ian Ziering who years ago had said something about like getting, he used to get letters in crayon and in lipstick. <laughs> and and that's such like a really great, I, I, for some reason, I've never forgotten that. But there's something about that that's like, it's a reminder that, oh yeah, we got fan mail. It wasn't it, it wasn't an email. It wasn't a social media comment. It wasn't a like on on Instagram. It was an actual handwritten letter. They used to deliver bags of letters That's to our right. dressing room. And and we could, you know, sift through them if we want to. And like, from all over from all over the world. I got mail from 
all regions of Africa and the East and like all over Europe, like the UK, like we were huge in Australia and like Brazil, like we literally got physical mail. I got to see stamps from countries I didn't even know existed. Right. Exactly. I used to collect those stamps. Um, I had like a whole book of them. Um, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and I'm far from a stamp collector, but that, you know, but that was just interesting to see where they all came from. And that did two things that showed us that the world was bigger and sort of the, the far reach that we had that I think is really hard to pinpoint these days. Um, you know, social media, you end up living in such a small little world that you don't really understand the impact that you're having and and how far reaching that is. Um, I think we understood that better because we were receiving snail mail. Um, and again, I go back to this, this comment that he made about lipstick and crayon and, and, and just sort of the difference of, of looking at getting letters, whether they were from a correctional facility or from you know, a seven-year-old who said, I was told to write to my first pen pal and I wanted it to be you (laughs) is such, right? But it's so interesting to look back at that because we really had a a better understanding of what we were doing and who we were, who we were talking to and who our audience was and, and um, what things resonated and what things didn't and what jokes, even just having the live audience and having people laughing in front of us and that, that immediate not only gratification, but, but understanding of like what actually worked so that the writers could right there on the spot say, oh, that joke sucked. Like, let's, let's swap that one out. Um, was just very interesting. And it was a much more hands-on experience as a whole than what people get now. It was a much more tangible, I think, experience than what people get now. Um, and I love that about it. I'm so grateful for that. Um, We had some, you know, incredible losses um, on our show. Um, Ted Wass, who played our father, his um, his first wife, um, Janet, passed. And shortly thereafter, our beloved director, Bill Bixby, died. And um, Bill Bixby, for those of us who grew up, um, you know, in the 70s proper and early 80s, he was Bruce Banner. Like he was the Hulk, Um, you know, for many of us growing up on TV and also had, you know, a a very uh, rich career. But for me, it was literally like the Hulk was directing us and he was very close with Don Rio. And Bill, um, you know, this was a time when cancer was still whispered. Um, but Bill worked literally until the day, um, before he passed away. And so we, you know, we were actively involved with a lot of loss. Um, and it was, you know, very, very painful. Um, Ted Wass ended up directing most of the rest of our show, which I I think felt really comforting, um, because it was one of us, you know, and Ted went on to have, and still has, you know, a very exciting directing career. But despite all of kind of the hard stuff, um, we also got to have, you know, we had these dream sequences in our early years um, where we had people like Little Richard and we had Alex Trebek and we had Alf and, you know, we had Sonny Bono and all these people. But we also had some really fun tie-ins. And Jenna and I also took dance lessons for many years together. We had the same teacher and we would do tap dance lessons in an empty sound stage. And it was like some of my f- my most fond memories were dancing with Jenna. She's an unbelievable dancer and in particular, <laughs> a really, really gifted tap dancer, which is like such an old lady thing to say, but it's a very specific skill for those of us who are classically trained as tap dancers. But P.S. We, not to interrupt, we, but my children would highly disagree with you that I am a good dancer. <laughs> this is This is going to come as a massive shock to them. <laughs> um, we also had the opportunity, though, to interact with, um, you know, some really, really enormous stars, uh, some of whom became larger stars. We interacted with Will Smith when he literally was called the Fresh Prince. He did mm. um, a crossover episode with us and we had Toby Maguire on and we had Bonnie Rabisi and like, you know, all these interesting David people. Schwimmer. David Schwimmer. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we also had like CNC Music Factory. We had Salt and Peppa. Um, we had B.B. King, which is like, you know, historically sure. fascinating and amazing. But um, I wonder when you think about kind of, you know, all of those sorts of memories, um, what what are your kind of like favorite memories just for you personally? Not really as, you know, what was great for, let's say, the show, but like what were some of your favorite things? For me, I think it was all in the smaller details. For me, the, the memories that stand out the most are you and I writing each other coded notes 
I've forgotten. We about, wrote notes like about we were boys. the we were the we were the only people in our junior high school class. It was literally like a class of two, and we would that's right, we would pass notes yes. and write in code. Yeah, we would we would pass notes and write in code um, that we were quite certain no one would figure out, which <laughs> in and of itself is really amazing. Um, and yeah, we would like talk about all of the boys on the show, which had I really been able to come out of my shell a little more, probably would have, <laughs> I might've been looking at some of the, of the female guest stars on our show too, Who knows? <laughs> but, um, that, but I didn't know that yet. Um, and yeah, we would write each other notes. And then I think the, the clothespin, the clothespins oh, before, that's, like, you know how we, it was like this right. inside joke where we would put clothespins on the back of each other's shirts before introductions yeah, so, to the audience. And, yeah, we should probably explain. So yeah. one of the, one of like the most often used at that time before there were clamps that grips used, they used like clothespins, like the kind that I used to use, like literally to hang clothing out on the line because right. I was born in the 1700s. Um, and it was like literally a, a running joke that people would clip the back of other people without them knowing with a clothespin. And, you know, for crew members who were particularly not in touch with their bodies, you'd sometimes have a line of clothespins like on their back, on their sweater, like, and it was just a thing. But um, yeah, we had a lot of in jokes. I mean, we were each other's entertainment. Like we literally, we didn't have junior, I didn't have junior high or high school. You know, I would go back on hiatus weeks, but it was awkward and not pleasant. And so, yeah, it was like all of our goofy things we did, we did together. But they were also so innocent. And I think that's part of it for me too, is there was like such an innocence about the inside jokes that we had, the secret codes and the clothespins and the, and maybe, I don't know, in the long run, maybe that's what it is that stands out for me is that, um, is being able to maintain that sort of innocence in this very not so innocent scenario of being in an adult world and making money and being in a business, um, I don't know. I, you know, maybe maybe that juxtaposition of this very adult business world against these sweet moments of funny that weren't, um, you know, that had like no sexual connotations and or innuendos or you know, I, I don't know. Maybe and maybe that's why I sort of not ignore, but sort of tr- try to like gloss over the the Playboy bunny peeps too. I don't know. Um, maybe you can, can talk a little bit about, you know, people are very curious about money and, um, I, I tend to not talk about it a lot, Mm -hmm. um, except to, to frame it for people. And I, I'm going to frame it the way I do. And then I'd like you to frame it the way you do. Sure. Um, People in the era that we were on television did not make the kind of money that people make now. And even like with inflation, like, the notion of sitcom acting, like we weren't, it was not a highly respected aspect of the industry. It was like, oh, you're on a sitcom. And like, it was awesome. It was fun. It was great. But we were not a critically acclaimed. I mean, people liked our show. I mean, we got a lot of criticism also because I think people were like two quirky girls on a show and like, oh, well, Joey Lawrence gets fan. Like they didn't know what to do with us. And people made horrible comments about my appearance, which have never left me since I've you know been 14 years old. Mm-hmm. Um, but we were not like... Um, you know, we didn't get awards. We were never nominated for anything. We were always like struggling to be in the top 25. It was always like the little show that could, you know, and we like Mm -hmm. kept going and we kind of finally got into our stride. But the notion that people would pay a lot of money at that time for sitcom actors, I think that Ted Danson on Cheers made $100,000 a week. And you literally, you would have thought he was making 10 million. People were like, it's disgusting. He ought to be ashamed of himself. Like people, and that was exorbitant. And it was exceptional at that time for yeah. Ted Danson to be making that much money. Um, I also like to remind people that while we were respected as women, um, I think the fact that I was a girl had a totally different standard in negotiations. Um, I think male lead actors 
definitely were paid differently. Um, and we did not get points in the show. Um, I did not have points. I'm assuming you didn't if I didn't. Yeah. And what that means is that the ownership of the show did not belong to cast members at that time. And it wasn't like, I don't want the headline for this podcast to be like, Maya Bialik was ripped off. Jenna Von Oy agrees. Like, it was <laughs> right. not, like, it, it wasn't in the consciousness to give ownership of the show to the stars. Like, it just wasn't. So, right. you know, obviously there are Jackie Coogan laws. And I, you know, like to tell people that, you know, approximately 25% of your salary before the age of 18 is set aside. The rest of it is essentially fair game. Like, there's that, that's just the truth of it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I like to remind people and I let people sort of fill in the blanks however they want. You know, when I went, to college, like, you know, I, I was not an independently wealthy, I never have to work again person. Um, I did have to work again. I continued to, I tutored, I did all the things that people do to make ends meet. I budgeted, I had to have a whole life. We did not make the kind of money that set us up for the entire universe. That's my take. And I'm curious if you'd like to share yours. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, my take is very similar. I, uh, well, a couple of things. One, you know, the, the money that I did, that I made, thankfully I had a dad who was incredibly savvy when it came to finances and also highly conservative. I was not so conservative because I didn't know how to be. And no one, including my dad, God bless him, ever really laid the groundwork for me to be, um, to have that understanding that I really needed. Um, and so that understanding came later like a fucking anvil on my head. Um, but that's, <laughs> but that's life, right? That's, I mean, to a certain extent, I know a lot of people outside of the industry who didn't make a ton of money, who also had this similar experience. Now I, we didn't make the kind of money that people make now by any stretch. I also acknowledge that we made more money than a hundred percent than children our age or most Absolutely. adults even. Uh, uh, made at that time. So I also don't want to ignore that. And, um, because sure. I do think that that's an important thing to say. Uh, but is that long lasting? Can that, can, can that support your family 40 years later? No, no, it cannot. Uh, you know, and the, for me, the struggle was really understanding that like after, so after I did Blossom and Lenny fairly soon after that, I went to college for a little bit. I went to USC film school and then I got on another, another show called the Parkers. Right. So for me doing those shows relatively back to back felt like money was just going to be there. It was, you know, it, and, and I, again, I didn't really have someone saying to me, Hey, here's how money works. And I really, in my head was like, once an actress, always an actress, I will always be working. This is, I'm, of course, I'm so passionate about this. How could I not continually work in perpetuity? <laughs> and, you know, and that's, that obviously is not always the case. Um, and, and, and also paths change. Uh, you know, I decided to have a family and, and move to Nashville and, and kind of have a Quite a bit of a quieter lifestyle. Um, and so I think the, the result of that though, is that so many people still assume that I'm going to have this massive house and tons of money. And that's confusing for me because I was 12 when I started the show and I was just shy of 18 when I finished it. I was just about to graduate from high school and go to college. And I did put myself through college. I paid for that. Um, and that was a big, a big chunk out of it. Um, especially going to a private school. Um, and I feel very blessed to have been able to do that for myself. I, I really, I'm, I'm, I feel very proud that I was able to do something that I know my parents would not have been able to do for me financially. Um, but, but being an adult, adulting is a whole other thing. Um, yeah, so you um, you did you you also have an exceptional singing voice and and did some singing and moved to Nashville and yeah you you kind of um, 
you, you did. You had a, a quieter, you know, existence. And also you were on TV, you know, for years when I was, you know, off in, in co- like I went to college and kind of left. Um, and that was sort of my, I mean, I think we each had different, you know, ways that we coped, obviously. Um, but you, you were married, um, and you have kids and you are no longer married. Um, but you know, and and I know you have talked about this and, you know, sort of when we first talked about it, I think it was at a time when like, all you had to say to me was like, love is love. And I was like, that's right. Love is love. Um, you have, I, I don't want to say chosen because it's not a choice, but you, you are in a relationship now, a long-term, um, a relationship with a woman. And I'm curious, um, you know, I'm, I'm asking this because, you know, I've known you <laughs> through, you know, like such critical, you know, developmental years of our life. And um, and I think the way that I want to ask it is like a way that I hope you'll, you know, take it well and answer in a way that's helpful to people. Um, were you always gay? Did you know that you were gay? Did you, is it, is it more complicated than that? Is it more about the person? Is it about sexuality? Is it about gender? Like, what is the evolution, you know, that that you get to now live a life that feels authentic, good, true, and also, you know, is bringing you so much joy? I think it's all of those things, really. Um, and yes, it is. It is complicated in that um, I didn't see in myself, or maybe I didn't allow myself to see for a long time, something that I, I am sure has been there. F- for much longer than, than I know or give it credit for. Um, I think that having spent so many years living up to these expectations, not just that other people set for me, but that I set for myself, um, I forgot to look through the lens of what makes me comfortable and uncomfortable, what I love and don't love, what is authentic for me without that layer of people pleasing and wanting to make sure that I, um, that I give everyone what they expect of me. Uh, and I think I finally started to take charge of that when I got divorced. Um, and when I started to sort of dig a little deeper and understand more about what that authenticity looks like for me, but bringing up authenticity, it's also important to say loving and being in relationships with men, I don't see any of those in the past as having been inauthentic in any way. There wasn't, I, I don't think that I was ignoring the fact that I was gay and putting on some sort of facade Mm -hmm. that I hope these men will now somehow forgive me for, uh, you know, I wasn't faking any of, of my love or friendship or any of it, you know? Um, but at some point I think there was this sort of little door that opened up and, and I moved in a little closer and grabbed the doorknob and said, well, let me, see what that means. See, let me see where this goes. And it opened up this world that I just really didn't know inside of me for a long time. I, I guess I've said before that women were never on my radar. I think when, I think it was my sister who like at the very beginning of my relationship with my girlfriend had said, you know, was this like something that you knew? Like, did you, were there other women that you were in love with? And I was like, no, women were never on my radar. And then I really thought about it. It's like, in retrospect, I think they probably really were. And I just, but I just didn't give myself, I didn't allow myself that because I grew up in a Catholic family in a small town. My dad studied to be a priest for God's sake. (laughs) And there's like, there's expectations of, 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 marrying a man and having, uh, the, you know, two kids in the white picket friend, fence and the dogs and the, you know, um, and I really, I thought that that was what I was supposed to do. This was a very like set thing, set lot in life for me. Um, and then as I've gotten older and I started really, again, taking charge of, of realizing that 
I can't possibly, first of all, it's such an impossibility to make everybody happy, right? We all know that. So, but like making myself happy, I started actually questioning, what does that look like? Um, and that was one of those things where I just, I realized that I had fallen in love with this woman and here we are. Um, how did your family react? Um, because, you know, you, you and I are a little bit older than a lot of people who are having mm -hmm. these kinds of conversations at sure. the stage of life, you know, like, um, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm curious. Yeah. I'm curious what that was like, if you found acceptance or if it was a mixed bag or kind of what that feels like now. By and large, people were really accepting. Um, I feel closer to some family members than I've ever, ever felt before because I think that authenticity was such a breath of fresh air and while unexpected was, you know, they, they knew that that was me saying, hey, you may or may not have a response that's fun or comfortable for me. And this may be a, a, an uncomfortable conversation for you, but, but here we are. Um, I have friends that I expected living in the South, obviously there it's, uh, the landscape is, is, is so challenging is such a misunderstatement at, especially at this time. Um, and I didn't really know what that would look like. And, uh, one of my dear friends who has been a friend of mine for over 25 years. He was kind of the last person that I told about my relationship with Kaylee. And he, uh, and he said to me, you know, the, the beauty of you telling me this is I suspect that you thought that my reaction was going to be to try to talk you out of it. But I want you to know that I love you. I love who you are. I am, I want you to be happy in whatever that happiness looks like for you. And regardless of religion, culture, background, any of it, um, my, I will walk beside you. And like, for me to abandon you in this moment says so much more about who I am or the lack of who I am than it does about who you are. He gave me this, he gave me this soulful love in this moment where I, I, he knew that I wasn't getting it everywhere that I needed it but it made up for it a little bit. You know, it just, it, it kind of, it kind of gave me a hand to hold that I didn't think I was going to have. You know, Don and I have talked about, um, trying to do a reboot, you know, in a way that we think would fit, um, yes. kind of the vibe of our show, which was, you know, you use the word groundbreaking. And I think, you know, with a lowercase G that feels right. Um, you know, yeah. Don has written, um, you know, not, it's not a dramatic reboot, but what he's written for us is, you know, a very grounded and, you know, kind of real approach to, um, you know, seeing what these characters would be like. And, um, you know, one of the things like, you know, Six was this like outrageous, she was, she was, she was an outrageous character. And, yeah. you know, one of the things that he's kind of teased about, you know, where Six would end up is, you know, like several successful divorces down the road, like living her best life, you know, <laughs> like really just like, this is where I'm at. And I just, I love that, that notion of kind of your, you know, the, the playfulness that you brought to this character. Um, you know, I think your character would probably be one of the funniest things uh, in, you know, in a non-comedy, like a non-sitcom kind of reboot format. Um, but if you were to sort of, um, you know, if you were to sort of like make your pitch for like what you're curious about, um, you know, if we were to do a reboot, uh, I'm, I'm curious, what what would your pitch be? Sort of why why you think people would be interested or why you're interested? I'm interested wholeheartedly. Um, the chemistry that our cast has, and I say has not had because it hasn't gone anywhere. And there's really something so, uh, so rare and special about that. This, we're, we are very exquisitely, um, connected in this way that I think people wouldn't understand unless they saw us together again. You know, we, we got mm. to have such a small glimpse of that guesting on call me cat with you. And, uh, and it feels like we never left. And that's, a, again, that's a really rare thing to have that sort of camaraderie between cast members, particularly when you consider how young we were when we all started together. Um, 
And I realize that we grew up together, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we grew up, you know, in a linear fashion. Like we all could have grown up and just completely gone awry. And I think the the beauty of the fact that we all have still have this connection is just that there's there's more to that. There's so much depth to that. People need to see that. You know, I, I want to. I, I think people deserve to see where that goes. Um, now, in terms of the character, I obviously I would. I love a flawed character. I love the <laughs> fact that toward the end of Blossom, we got to do as much as much as we could push the envelope in the '90s. We did with six dating an older man, and um, mm-hmm. y- you know them can blossom and six considering smoking a joint. And like, there were so many crazy things, you know, six's parents got divorced, which seems so That's sweet right. and innocent right now. But, but then it was like such a big thing. Um, and so timely in terms of our age range at that time too. Um, so I just, I can only imagine what that looks like, what that ground break with the lower G looks like right now. Um, for us to push boundaries and, and explore. Um, I don't know. I, I just, for me, it's the chemistry. I just, I love the idea of getting us all back together and it's, you know, and even if it's in a slightly different capacity than what people expect of us, and I hope that it is, I hope that it makes, I hope that we can do that and give people an opportunity to sort of think outside the box a little bit and, and, and look at, maybe be a little bit introspective and and look at like where they were when we were in this 12 to 14 year old nineties zone. Mm. Um, and what that looks like now for them, where, where our brains are, where we've, where we've all come around and, and where we're still trapped. Uh, well said, I mean, honestly said better than I can. So I will, uh, I will <laughs> hand that to Don. Um, also, but before we let you go, as we mentioned in the intro, um, you you do other creative things, um, and maybe you can tell us a little bit about the Cassandra Project, which is um, a short film trilogy that talks about women's voices. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. I you know I've been writing for a really long time. It's always been kind of a, a part of me, and it's taken on different different levels of of. Um, interest as the years have gone on, but, um, but I've always written scripts here and there. And one of my best friends, Barkley DeVoe, who's an amazing, uh, producer and director who was in USC film school with me, but we've actually, we grew up together in New York auditioning, um, and swore one day that we would work together in a, in a greater capacity. She called me last September and said, I, I have this trilogy that I'd like to do. And it's, it's loosely based on, um, her own experience with just spending over eight months dealing with horrible, horrible health issues and painstakingly attempting to convince doctors that it wasn't all in her head. Um, and, uh, finally she found a team of doctors who believed her. And so this trilogy sort of came about, was born out of her, out of her pain and anger and, and trying to sift through what it means to just not be believed in, in the middle of all of that. Um, and so she, she called me and she said, I have this idea and I'd like for you to try and write one of the scripts. And, um, so I took immediately when she said that to me, I thought of this, of this dream that my older daughter had had a few years ago. She's 11 now. And I, I, I want to say she had the dream when she was seven or eight. And it was this incredibly vivid, vibrant, um, profound dream. And this, it, the script that I wrote is sort of my interpretation of what that dream means. It's awesome. And, um, you know, such an important, such an important thing for you to do, um, you know, especially as someone who means so much to, to so many women, as I know that you do, um, this was really, really a delight, a really fun trip down memory lane. Um, you know, I feel a really, obviously, deep love and connection with you and always will. You know, we literally grew up together. We were, um, you know, we were forced siblings who really weathered a tremendous amount together. And I'm, you know, very grateful that you were in my graduating class. <laughs> Same here, as sm- as small as it was. Three students. Yes, right. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Jenna. Thank you for having me. There's a lot in there. 
is interesting to hear. I mean, we we had different experiences and we lived the same experience, you know? And yeah, I was like the star of the show, but like it didn't, I don't know, for me, it just, it felt like we were always in everything together. We experienced everything together. I didn't get to ask her what she thought in like the first days of meeting you. Like she gets oh, on the please. set. She had to pretend this... to like me. I was the star of the show. I know, but like I wanted her to like sidebar with me and be like, what no, you we really were, think of that kooky we were, kid? Look, no, what what I remember is that like she was from a small town in Connecticut, you know? Like it was literally like transplanting her to LA, you know? I mean, I remember when I met her, I met her literally outside of Paul Wood and Tony Thomas's offices. Like I, I can picture the hallway. She wore the hats more than I did. That's something people don't know. She actually was the hat wearer. I had like, whatever, some hats were, but like it wasn't a thing. She actually started the trend and then I wore it in like one publicity shoot and that was it and it took off like wildfire, but she still wore hats. Sometimes we both wore them. Would hats have been a thing had she not worn it to the audition? I mean, she has stories about you that we She's got get. all my secrets. I'm like, did, were you nice to her at the beginning or were you were like, I'm the star? I was star. nice. But, no. But you were so grumpy I was never back like then that. in general, <laughs> reading your Camus and like being so <laughs> grumpy and Catcher in the Rye-esque, even though you weren't Catcher in the Rye. So like, I wonder if she got like the, oh, I, I got to like be careful and I eggshells around this one. No, it wasn't like that. I was perky. I was perky and hopeful at the beginning. Um, you know, when I started, I was 14. Um, yeah, but by 16, you were like wearing dark makeup. and you Oh, by 15, it was over. It was over. Um, no, I wasn't wearing, I was definitely having to explain to Joey. Like Joey was like, why don't you shave? Why aren't you like other girls? And I was like, because I'm different. Um, and so like Jenna had to tolerate, I think, a lot of that like back and forth and like learning about how strange I was. Um, but no, I wasn't like, we, I, I don't think I was ever mean to her. I think that as... As things got more complicated and we did have a lot of loss on our show, um, that absolutely played out, you know, into all of our experience. You know, I had never experienced really death of someone close to me. And we had, mm -hmm. you know, Ted Wass, who was, you know, a, a young man. Like, now that I'm 47, like, I could do the math. Like, he was not, he had two little kids when, when Janet died. Like, it was hard. It was a really hard time. And it just sort of like played out. There was a heaviness to us, you know. Um, Michael Stoyanov, you know, definitely had feelings about being a young, frustrated, you know, actor who wanted more out of his career. Like, it was just like everything. But there still was a lot of joy, a lot of fun. Um, and I always felt very close with Jenna, you know. I always felt like she was the one who best understood what was going on. And, oh, we'll do a whole separate thing on the, the code that we used. I could I could show you. We didn't break down the code. What was it? I can tell you the code. I'll tell you the code. You want another okay, code? Okay, tell us. So if you make a grid, like hash marks, and you put three dots in every square, that's that's the alphabet. So the upper left quadrant of three dots, if you put a dot on the left side, that's A. In the middle, that's B. And on the right side, that's C. In the upper middle quadrant, the three dots is D-E-F-G-H-I. It goes all the way through the hashtags. For the last one, there'll only be two dots. That's Y and Z. But um, you can write entire notes and letters, and we did, in code. Or sometimes if we were, like, writing about a boy, because, like, we would interact with, like, other TV stars, um, you know, like, at things and events and teen events. It's so, like we would just use the code to, um, to write out their name. If we could find one of those letters... And discover who you were talking about. We had, we had to, oh, I, I know who we were talking about. Who were you talking about? I'm not telling you. How did you interact or were impacted by the dream sequence ladies that would be We're cast? not talking about that now. We can have a whole other episode where Jonathan is the host of Mayim Bialik's Breakdown and his guest star is 90s star Mayim Bialik. We'll do a whole episode <laughs> like that. You can ask me all the things. If you want to submit questions for that episode, <laughs> send it to Appialic Breakdown. We're going to start collecting the uh, 90s questions star, 90s star questions for young Mayim Bialik, the retrospective of her early days. I might even put on makeup for that episode. <laughs> <laughs> All right. With that, from our breakdown to the one we hope you never have. We will see you next time. It's Maya Bialik's Breakdown. She's going to break it down for you. She's got a neuroscience PhD or two. One fiction, one and now she's going to break down.